Okay, welcome back. Um, I hope that everyone had a good spring break and got some good time away just to kind of chill, but y'all are grad students, a lot of you, so probably not too much time to chill, who knows. Um, so um, in this lecture, we're continuing our study of non-parametric uh, machine learning algorithms, so non-parameterized non algorithms. Uh, last time we looked at like the k nearest neighbor algorithm, um, very simple algorithm, um, I like it a lot. Today's algorithm is also, <clears throat> well, the concept behind today's algorithms are simple. Um, and they are used in one of the most like, I would think one of the, um, the best algorithms that there is and that's um, random forests. So random forests is probably one of the, like the best machine learning algorithms I can think of for a lot of different tasks. And those are made up of what are called decision trees or regression trees. Okay, so in order to get to random forest, we have to talk about these. Now, um, so what are decision trees? So these are non-parametric supervised learning methods used for both classification and regression. So just like k nearest neighbors could be used for classification and regression, so can these trees. Um, and the goal is to create a model that predicts the value of the target variable by learning a simple set of decision rules, which is inferred from the data. Okay, so we're unlike um, like literally calculating out some like function, we're looking at maybe a, a discrete set of rules that will give us a classification or regression value, okay? Um, oh, I, I have that written here. A tree can be seen as a piecewise constant approximation. So it's like a piecewise function of rules that you just apply on the different features of a feature vector, okay? Um, and okay, so what else did I write here? So decision trees tend to be the method of choice for predictive modeling because they are relatively easy to understand and are also very effective. Okay, so that's, I, I'm glad I read that line. They, the, a lot of algorithms that we deal with are kind of like black boxes in a sense. Like you train the algorithm with that gradient descent or even with k nearest neighbors, maybe um, you train it and then you get predictions, but you don't really understand why the predictions are being made the way that they are. Now you can dive into like looking at distributions of weights on neural networks, for example, to kind of get an idea, but still it's more or less not easy. With decision trees, once you have a trained model, you can literally go through it step-by-step step and understand why it's making those predictions. And that's why it's a preferred model in many different instances. It's not as like sexy or attractive as like a deep neural network model, but like it's, it's there. And I always encourage students to like, I know, Deep neural nets are, are cool. I think they're cool. But in practice, something like k nearest neighbors or preferably a decision tree would be better. Okay. So, um, all right. So, okay. The basic goal of a decision tree is to split the population of data into smaller segments. That's probably not the best way to um, define this, this concept. Uh, the way that I think of it is as partitioning the the feature space into blocks. So if you, like if you think about two-dimensional feature space, so like X1 and X2 or your feature measurements, what a decision tree will make is a bunch of orthogonal lines everywhere that partition that space into regions where those regions will, um, will tell you what the class is, right? Or the average of the values in those regions can tell you the, the regression value, right? So it's, it has a very nice geometric interpretation. And I said the word orthogonal and I like, want to make sure that you know what that means. It's just lines perpendicular to the, the given axis of the, of the feature space. Okay, okay so um, this is a, a rough image that I took from some article here, which you should click on and kind of go through. I thought it was a nice article. Um, it kind of depicts on how these, like, how these trees work. So, um, my PhD is actually in graph theory and graphs are like what I love. And uh, this is a graph to me when I look at that. It's a discrete mathematical object. Um, it's a directed graph. So there is direction on the relations. And the way that these work in uh, machine learning and with decision tree models is that you start with a root node. Right? And the root node takes as input basically all of your data. Right? And based off of some rule that is learned during training, the data split into two subnodes, okay? And 
the idea behind this is that we want to somehow make the sub nodes more pure, like in quotes, pure than the root node. And what do I mean by that? I mean that we want a decision node to be primarily consisting of one class of objects, right? We want both of them, like the weighted sum of both of them to be like the, the data has been split in such a way that they're like uh, class A or class B. On, like class A would be on the left, class B would be on the right. You want like the majority in here to be of one class and the majority over here to be in another class. And the, if, a, if a node is only consistent of one class of, of, of data, like class A, then it's said to be pure, right? And I think based off of what I was just saying, I wasn't planning on it, but maybe I will actually go in and kind of discuss how the algorithm learns more so than how to implement it. Um, but in any case, these decision nodes are split until we reach these leaf nodes. Leaf nodes are typically breached after a maximum depth has been reached. So like the root node is at depth zero, its children are at depth one, go one more down, depth two, so forth and so on. And what you'll do is you can like, like set a limit, like max depth four or something, right? Or it will automatically stop when all, of, when all of the children nodes become pure, right? When they all consist of a single class, right? So, um, right, so the leaf nodes are where the predictions are made. Now we're gonna talk about this again in a few minutes, but basically you feed in a given feature and then you decide what, which direction to go which direction to go and eventually you end up at a leaf node and whatever the class is in that leaf node is what you'll predict the class to be or whatever the average value is will be the regress regressed value okay okay so um to illustrate this this concept we're going to use the skykit learn library and we're going to use a different data set than the iris data set for once we're going to use an artificial data set and the reason why i'm choosing to use this artificial data set is that there are two exercises in the, in the textbook that I really want all of you to try to do. Um, on, in the section on decision trees, the last two problems work with this make moons data set. Okay. So um, let's go ahead and import our standard libraries here. So matplotlib, uh, pandas, numpy, and seaborn. And we're actually going to use Seaborn a little bit and not just use it to set the theme today. And then here from the sklearn.datasets module, we're importing the make moons function. This is an artificial data generator. So then uh, make moons will return a collection of um, like vectors or numpy arrays. So just two features, right? And so these are two features inside of this uh, numpy array here. And then here, these are the labels. They're either zero or one. I set the number of samples to be a thousand. I put some noise on it to make it kind of a little bit messy. And then I choose the random state to be three so that y'all will also have the same exact data set that I'm using, right? So setting the random state is important when you're trying to reproduce things, okay? And then um, I make a colors list here just to get the colors of the, the data points. So like, uh, I say that if it's given a label zero, then it'll be red. And if it's um, else, it's gonna be blue. Okay, so if it's label one. Set my fig size, scatter all the points, and then set my labels, show a grid, and then show the thing. Okay, so here, this is the make moons output, right? With a thousand data points, right? Now, Clearly, this is not linearly separable, right? There is no line that would separate these two different classes, right? So um, the perceptron logistic regression would like struggle in this. Now, deep neural networks could figure this out, but it would learn it and then we would have no idea why, right? Like why it was able to like classify what about the features determines the class. So that's why we're going to try to use a decision tree. Um, however, before we begin, we need to do something that we should do from now on and forever, and that's split the data into um, a training set and a testing set. Okay. Um, and so I call the Sky, uh, SkyKit Learn 
sklearn.modelSelection module. From that, I get the test train splits, the easiest way to do this. Um, I will say that uh, I have had questions about time series data splitting from students, and you should not use this function to do test train splits on time series data. There is a different way that you need to think about time series data, and we might get to that at the very end of the semester. So I get my X train, X test, Y train, Y test. Um, so that's train test split, pass in my X, pass in my Y, test size 40%, random state 42, just for reproducibility. Um, I don't know why I decided to do this, to get the colors and plot them like that, but it's not necessary, but it might be nice to visualize it later. So I get the, the colors and then um, I scatter the training data. So I just like, it's gonna look basically the same because there's so many points, right? Um, notice though, like this like red dot right here inside of the blue, that's from that's because of the noise. If I didn't put any noise in the data, like it'd be very clearly separated. Right? Like maybe I should just like show you real fast what that would look like if I just put like very little noise. It's like, you see what I mean? So I'm gonna not do that to make it a little bit more difficult. So what did I have? 0.4 or something? I can just like back to it. What did I have? Point two, there. Okay. So um, playing with that that the the noise um, keyword argument is actually kind of nice. So you can try different types of algorithms on it. Um, and um, yeah. Okay. So in order to like understand how these decision trees really work, we're just going to um, call um, the decision tree classifier a class from sklearn.tree module. Okay, so um, I have max depth here four, I mean three. I kind of want it to be a four for some reason. Um, no, like just me thinking about the problem and thinking about all the noise, I just want to say four. So I'm going to change this to a four right here. Random state is 42 because um, the, the instances of the uh, decision tree classifier class are generated stochastically. So if we want to have the same results as me, set the random state to be 42. So here I instantiate my model equal, so call it decision tree. And then um, I just do decision tree dot fit. This is the fit method in sklearn. We talked about that last time. And we're going to fit that on the training data. OK, so now that it's been fit, we can visualize the, the tree structure of this trained decision tree using the um, plot tree function from the sklearn.tree module. Now this is where like decision trees are awesome because you can look at, look at this visualization and kind of understand what features are leading to what. So, okay, so tree rules, um, export text. So that's a function here um, from the dot tree module. I pass in my trained decision tree and I give it feature names X0 and X1. Okay. Um, and I'm going to print these out. So this will be kind of like a, it's almost like a terminal output of like, like a, a directory structure. That's what it'll look like. But here, this will be the thing that I think is the coolest. Here is this uh, plot tree thing. So plot tree, pass in your decision tree, give it feature names, class names. Uh, I'm setting grounded to be true, filled to be true, font size to be 14, and you'll see why there's a font size um, like that. So here is the output of the, the show, the plot tree. So also, like when you're on your own, I encourage you to look at this structure here. It's also useful. Um, but this is a, just a nice, um, nice image, and you can like export it and save it to understand what's going on. So um, looking at this, we see that um, there's roughly the same number of, of samples and like red and blue um, and slightly more blue here. <laughs> and that's why the color's a little bit off. Um, this Gini index is actually uh, the purity. So Gini is the purity and it's, it's equal to um, one minus the, the sum of the probability squared so the probability of choosing a blue, right? Probably choosing a red, right? Like squaring that, so then one minus that value will give you that, that Gini uh, index is what it's called. And it's 
0.5 right now because it's basically the same number of blue and red in that that node right so we want to split somehow and it looks like the decision tree learned that if the y or the x1 value was less than um, 0 0.325 there then we're going to split to the left and then otherwise split to the right so um actually i have this like right here so uh, the figure above depicts a graph theoretic tree that is used to make predictions. So suppose we're given a feature vector x0 comma x1, right? So we start at the root node and then it learns not 0 0.268, it learns 0 0.32, so it's a little bit different. So if x1 is that, then you move down to the root's left child node at def1, otherwise move to the root's right child node. So Right now, if this entry is small enough here, then we're moving to the left. If it's greater than that, strictly greater than that, we're moving to the right. And then we successively repeat this. So X1, so like suppose we moved this way, right? Like X1 was like 0 0.5. Then we'd move over here. And then if X2 was, uh, I mean, so if X0 was like 1.2, then we'd move over here move over here, move over here, so forth and so on. Okay, now um, notice like the colors here, right? So like this is predominantly red and you look at its Gini measure, this purity measure here. It's 0 0.089. That's like a, a very pure node in this decision tree. And you can tell by looking at 245 reds versus 12 blues. Here, this is completely blue. Its, its purity is zero. Right. It, I mean, sorry, impurity. I kept on saying purity. Impurity is zero. So um, that means that it's all one class inside of there. And that's a leaf. You can see it has no children. Right. Um, and then it looks like all of these other ones are going red. And then these are all blue. Yeah. Question. Um, so for the nodes that branch, can you explain like why some of them branch on X0 and why some on X1? It de so you're t so right now you're asking a question related. So the question was, um, say it one more time. Yeah. So like for the, for the notes that do branch, like when do we know which feature that they branch on? Like zero. So that that is what's learned during training. Okay. So during training, the algorithm will choose the feature, right? The feature and value that splits the data that leads to the most what's called information gain. Um, and it just, it really depends on how pure, the weighted sum of the purity of the two children notes, right? So, um, and maybe I'll like, I'll draw something to kind of like illustrate that, that process in a moment. Okay, so here, um, let's look at the decision regions using that mlx10.plotting module that I found. Let's see what happens. Okay, so that's not bad, right? But notice like, notice the regions of space are like, they're separated by these orthogonal lines, right? So my guess right now is that, okay, what was the first rule? It was X1 less than or equal to 0.3 basically, right? So X1, 0.3 right here, right? So it looks like the best split that it found at the very beginning, when you're looking at all of the data, right? The best split that it found was a line going like this, right? A line that split it like that. That would split the space into two regions. But actually, let's like, let me go back up here and train it again. Let's do max depth equal to like, uh, like one or something. You don't have to do this with me. I just want to show you. So max depth one train um yeah so max depth is one right so let's look at what it found did it find the same one yes 0 0.3 so coming down here there you see that so then um so you can think of the nodes in the tree as the regions of space question yes the further you go down, the more lines will start crossing the, the data into, into pieces. Each, because basically, each 
like like this and like these regions of space you can think of as the nodes in the tree like looking back at the the, the image here we have the blue node and the red node right so if x1 was less than or equal to 0 0.325 um so if that wasn't the case and we went up this way right so this is the the left child and this is the right child so let's let's say like play with this again because we're using that random seed we can see what the next step would have been so max depth equal to two now okay and so now the max depth is two and let's look at the regions of space So um, there were just two nodes now, but now there's like, so what's what's going on here? So this is the first line there, right? And then it was split here, right? And again, it's just, it's splitting. So each of like, maybe I, I should say I, I, I misspoke earlier. So like in the first picture, you could think of it as like the nodes is like the regions, right? Now you can think of like the, the like each node that's splitting off, right, is like making an inequality, right? That's trying to like put more and more lines. This go, goes back to your point. Like the, the larger the depth, the more lines you're, you'll see. So like we already saw what four did. Um, we won't be able to get a good picture of, um, so it's like maybe max depth equal to like 10 or something. 20, whatever. Okay, this picture is going to be weird. It's probably not even going to show. Yeah. <laughs> but um, so let's see what this looks like now. See what's happening? See how it's like getting that, right? Um, that actually looks really good. Like, no, but it's deceiving. So why would this be deceiving is like a really good, like it, it could be, right? But we have to be very careful. Like, let me, let me go like, let me push it a little bit and maybe go like 40. The picture is gonna be ridiculous. All right, so now the depth was 40. So what, like, um, what do you think can happen if you're not careful when, when choosing this parameter? Exactly. Decision trees are notoriously bad at overfitting. And if, like, if you think about it, if you let the number of rules like completely, like, like if you don't put a bound on the maximum depth, right? what's going to happen at each like look it's already starting to happen like here like there's only one thing in each of the leaves so basically if you if you let like like if you let the number like uh, the depth go as far as it possibly can go every leaf will have exactly like one thing in it <laughs> right and, like and that's not every leaf but the like you'll have a bunch of that and that's really overfit Right. Like, for example, I see this little, you see that little blue bar right there extending? That noise caused that, right? The noise in the data caused that. The true data is like kind of like more centered over here. This is like kind of most likely inside that blue region should be the red, the red values, right? Yes, question. It's finding, it's, it's fitting the model with the data that we have. It's basically memorizing the data that we have. <laughs> but the whole point of like machine learning is to make predictions on unseen data, right? So that, it, this is a problem right here because these sh really should be like red in general, like in that region of space right there. And, um, but uh, let's go back to the one that like maybe was like a little bit more reasonable, like max depth of like like fifteen or something. I don't know. So I do a max depth of fifteen. 
still not going to be a, a legible picture really. 15 is probably still too much, but like, yeah, I'm going to do 10. Something that, and, um, but as you can see though, it's like training really fast and it's able to learn these very complex separating regions, right? So if there were a way to let the trees learn these, like a tree learn the separation, but then like account for the overfitting, then we would have a very robust algorithm. And that's where random forests come into play. And which is related to what's called ensembling methods. So un ensemble, yeah, ensemble methods. So now that we've like, we have this like nice picture, we can say, okay, um, maybe let's look at the uh, confusion matrix and see how it's doing. Now, a warning, when we, um, when we do this, it sets one of the calls in this, this function is no longer gonna allow us to look at our decision tree like edges up here. So if you wanna see your tree again, after doing that, reset your kernel. So again. Okay, that's like, that's like pretty good. No other model that we had could have could have done that. And that was on um, the test data, right? Yeah, so we make some predictions on the test. And this is the confusion matrix on that test data. Yes, question. So looking at the confusion matrix, which we kind of did last time, right? Look at how many um, reds we predicted to be blue, three of them, right? And look at how many um, uh, predicted reds were blue, seven of them, right? Out of how many total, right? <laughs> and then along the diagonal, we see that the majority of the entries are here, right? So just a quick, like that, this is not like a, a full on thorough analysis of it. It's just like quickly looking at that. That was on test data. That makes me confident in what happened here. Okay. So then if we look at our classif um, classification report, um, we can see that yes, we, we like more or less we're good. 97% accuracy. Um, look at the F1 score, look at the recall. Everything is, is high, right? And again, I, I don't know if you remember, but like the data that we had last time with the iris data set and like trying to pick a, a classifier to like score like above like 80%. Like that was difficult, right? And I'm pretty sure that this data is, if not more difficult to classify on, like roughly the same. Right. So I encourage you to try to like compare. Like on the maybe on the moon's data, like artificial data set, like compare the algorithms that we know and see which ones would be best. Right. I'm almost positive the out, out of the ones that we know right now, it would be a decision tree. Okay. So I, I like I'm looking at you out there and I don't see that you're impressed by this. <laughs> like Data, yeah. And I tried using all the algorithms first, and it was really, really fast. Right. Really fast. Right. So decision trees for data like this would work, but more generally speaking, random forests will will do the like. Random forests will, cons like I, in my experience, will consistently perform at at levels that like the other algorithms will not touch, unless like you have a very deep, like a very like fine-tuned deep neural network, then that's like comparable. Question? Right. Oh, you said the only drawback was overfitting. There is another problem that can occur. Um, notice that the lines are indeed like orthogonal to the axes, right? Now, 
if you like, okay, so if you rotate this data, right, if, if the data is somehow like rotated 90 degrees or something, you'll get a completely different decision tree answer. Even though it's like the same data, like, trans, like if you just translate it by 90 degrees, same data, right? Nothing changes about the labels, right? Um, the decision tree may not perform as well as it did before. So rotational changes in data sometimes happen, right? And knowing that that's, that could be a problem with a decision tree is important. Another thing is that um, um, outliers like can, can really mess with the performance. Um, I will provide you guys with a link describing this. And so you can like go through this notebook and kind of see what, it's on the Iris data set, I'm pretty sure if I remember correctly. But like, for example, like these outliers over here in blue, like this right here, that like little stretch of blue right there, those two outliers, that is like, I don't know if I should be concerned about it, but it seems like it's related to the problems that can occur with outliers because for whatever reason, these two values here, looks like they have made this little strip of, of region here that's inside of the orange that if we did another random state and like get, got more data to like test on, like that would not be there, right? Um, so, well, but again, I will pro I'll provide links for this so that you can read through it. Okay, so um, actually that concludes part one of today's lecture. So I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording here, and then we'll take like a 10-minute break. <laughs>